Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the ninth season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is Advancements in Congenital Heart Disease, and we have a terrific show for you today. Today's show is Advancements in Treatments for HLHS Heart Warriors, and our guest is Dr. Edward Beauvais. Dr. Edward L. Beauvais is a renowned pediatric cardiac surgeon and an internationally recognized expert on the treatment of complex congenital heart disease. He joined the faculty at the University of Michigan as Director of Pediatric Cardiovascular Surgery and became head of the section of cardiac surgery in 1999. Dr. Beauvais was inaugurated as the first Helen and Marvin Kirsch Professor of Surgery in 2005 and Chair of the Department of Cardiac Surgery in 2012. Dr. Beauvais has received support for his research from the American Heart Association, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institutes of Health, and the LeDuc Foundation. He has given hundreds of presentations on heart surgery around the world. He has served on numerous committees, including the American Heart Association, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, and the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. Dr. Beauvais serves on a number of editorial boards, has published over 300 manuscripts, dozens of book chapters, and edited two books. So welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. Beauvais. Thank you, Anna. It's great to be with you. Well, I have to start by telling you that when I announced on Facebook you were coming on my show, we got a lot of likes and hearts, and people are so excited that you are on the program today. That's great. That's very nice to hear. In fact, the woman who introduced you to me, Carrie Van Eck, told me to tell you that Jonah is now 20 years of age and doing great. Well, that's great to hear. Believe me, it's so rewarding to see these kids grow up to be adults. I can't tell you what it means. Oh, I can just imagine. You have been kind of like one of the grandfathers of HLHS surgery, haven't you? Well, you're making me feel old, but um, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) When my patients are now adults and coming back to see me, I know it's uh, it's a blessing and a curse, I suppose. (laughs) Well, you certainly have been at the forefront of HLHS surgery, so that's what I want to focus on today, even though I know you are an expert and have done so many other surgeries. I think, at least in my world, you are best known for your HLHS surgery. So let's talk about the prognosis for babies born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or HLHS, prior to the 1980s. Well, that obviously was a very dark time, and essentially the prognosis was that these babies all died. It was a uniformly fatal condition when a diagnosis was made, and generally it was made, I think, in that era, probably after the babies were born. Parents were advised that there's nothing that can be done and that they should just take their baby home to die, and clearly that was something that no doubt stimulated many people to start thinking that there should be something we can do. But before 1980, it was a very dismal outcome. Right. So what was the turning point for babies born with HLHS that allowed them to begin to survive? You know, it's hard to point to one single turning point. I think quite candidly, it was so many things that started to come together, certainly not the least of which is the pioneering efforts of people like Dr. Norwood, who first showed that, in fact, survival was possible. And this, indeed, I think, kicked off a tremendous amount of interest in many centers throughout the country to say, well, if we can do it once, why can't we do it more often? So it really was the unwavering efforts of the entire team, the surgeons, the cardiologists, the nurses, the anesthesiologists, and first and foremost, the parents who were unbelievable in allowing us to try and make efforts full well realizing, certainly back in that era, that survival was highly unlikely. Right, right. So what advancements actually led to the survival of babies with HLHS. I had Dina Barber on my show earlier this season, and she actually gave us a 30-year perspective over congenital heart disease in general. And she talked about prostaglandin and the blalactosic shunt. Can you tell me a little bit more about those kind of advancements that led to the survival of babies with HLHS? 
Yeah, I think it was perhaps unfortunately, but it was the very mistakes we were making which taught us how to change and then go back and correct them to improve. No doubt the biggest advancement, at least in my own opinion, was that we began to understand the physiology of a single ventricle heart better because the reality of it was we didn't really have a good idea what it meant to control blood flow to the lungs, to make sure that you didn't have too much, to do all sorts of things that we now sort of take for granted. But back then, we really didn't understand. I can remember in the early days thinking that when you did the original palliative operation that the higher the oxygen saturation, the better off you must be. Well, now we learn how obviously that was wrong. So I think understanding the physiology allowed us to direct our surgical efforts to mimic the most stable type of heart we could do. And then personally, I think the other biggest advance was the second stage, the so-called volume unloading procedures, known basically as a bidirectional glen or hemifontan. I think back to the early era when we finally got patients to survive stage one, but we really didn't know an awful lot about what to do next, and then we started using second shunts because they'd outgrow the original one, and that was disastrous. And again, it was because we didn't understand what that really meant, not because the surgery was bad, but because the whole idea was wrong. And we did fontans early in life, and that didn't have a good outcome. So really, the ability to do the superior vena cava to pulmonary artery connection now really gave us the opportunity to remove the risk factors stabilize these young children and allow them to grow and develop to become good candidates for the Fontan without all the risk factors associated with some of the other operations. Wow. I had no idea that you all learned those kinds of things and that had such a big difference in the lives of children with HLHS. I actually met a gentleman, Brian Rothline, who wrote for a book called The Heart of a Father, which was the companion to the book that you wrote a forward to for me, The Heart of a Mother. And in The Heart of a Father, Brian Rothline was actually born in the 1970s, and he was born with HLHS and had a Blaylock toxic shunt, and then years later had another Blaylock toxic shunt, and he is still alive today. Of course, since then, he's had a Fontan procedure, but it's interesting that you said that people who had that done prior often died. Well, they did. Obviously, not all did, but the babies would then outgrow the original shunts we put in when they were newborns. Again, we were learning that the smaller the shunt, oftentimes the better you were, not the other way around. And then it just logical, well, if they've outgrown the shunt, we'll just add another one or give them more blood flow to the lungs and this will be perfect. And then what that did essentially was produce so much of a what we call a volume load on the ventricle that the ventricles began to fail even quicker. And this is what I meant earlier to say that these advancements were kind of made on the backs of unfortunately learning not necessarily how to do the operation per se, but how to tailor it for this type of physiology so that we could safely get these children to older ages when they can tolerate Fontans much better. Wow. Wow. It's amazing to me how you doctors have been able to work on such tiny, tiny hearts and learn what you have so that you can have the success that you have today. It truly is amazing. But we do need to take a quick commercial break. Don't leave yet, listeners, because when we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Beauvais about current trends in saving HLHS heart warriors. We'll be back in just a moment. The most common theme that I hear is why. She always needed uh, a lot of attention. She had strokes. Even though it's a natural inclination to withdraw from the CHD community, I think being a part of it helped me be part of the solution. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern. I'm Michael Lieben, and I'll be your host as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home tonight forever. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. 
If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Advancements in Treatments for HLHS Heart Warriors, and our guest is Dr. Edward Beauvais. So I really enjoy talking about the history of HLHS treatments, but let's talk about current trends for babies born with HLHS. I'm amazed that they can actually do surgery in utero, and they've been doing this in Boston for a number of years now. Can you tell us what you think about the ability for some babies to actually receive treatment in utero, Dr. Beauvais? Yeah, I think, to be frank, the jury is probably still out. We are doing this as well here in Ann Arbor and have an active program. The efforts that are being made for in utero intervention are really aimed at trying to prevent or perhaps minimize the sometimes devastating complications that can occur in certain hearts with HLHS. For example, if the atrial septum is intact or nearly so, There's no way to get blood out of the lungs, and then, therefore, the lungs are badly damaged in utero so that when these babies are born, often the damage is irreversible, and, of course, the prognosis is then extremely grave. So the thought is, could an in utero intervention by opening this septum, in other words, relieving the obstruction, or perhaps opening up a thickened valve that is obstructed to allow blood flow to go across the heart and allow growth of the heart muscle, can this really affect the outcome. I think a lot of the problem arises is can we intervene early enough on these babies to improve their outcome, or are we, to put it somewhat crudely, sort of kicking the can down the road? In other words, things may be better, but we may still not be able to completely avoid the complications. I think it's an outstanding way to go. We obviously share in the group at Boston who really pioneered this that this is something we need to be looking at, and I have no doubt that as technology gets better and things get safer, we'll be able to intervene perhaps earlier and perhaps really improve that segment of babies who are already born with devastating conditions that we can no longer treat. Yes, it seems like for the people that I've talked to who have gone that route, it's a lot more operations than the babies who have the traditional three-stage procedure? Well, it may well be. I think it depends a little bit on the precise condition that you're trying to affect in utero. And sometimes they may need more operations to try to recondition their hearts or allow some of the chambers to grow. But as I said earlier, I really do think that the jury is out if we're really able to For example, allow a left ventricle to grow better in utero so that we can eventually do a two-ventricle repair rather than a single-ventricle approach. I don't know that we've really been able to show that yet, to be honest. Right, right. In fact, when I first heard about this, that's what I thought the outcome would be, that those babies would have all four chambers. And so wouldn't that be amazing? They wouldn't actually be born with HLHS. But now that I've actually talked to some of the survivors, that's not the case. It's just that they may have a better chance for survival, but they'll still have an HLHS heart. Is that the case in most of the situations that you've seen? Yes, I think it is. And that's what I meant earlier by saying, are we kicking the can down the road or are we really materially affecting the outcomes? And I don't think we know, but I think your point's well taken. What we are seeing is that the ventricles may grow a little bit better, but we're probably as of yet not intervening early enough to allow them to be normal, if I could put it that way, ventricles that could really support the circulation. Right, right. Well, it seems that there is another trend, and that is that of the hybrid surgeries. Can you tell us about the hybrid surgeries available for HLHS babies? Yes, hybrid surgeries are something that we do frequently here as well. And for those who may not be familiar with it, it basically means that you're sort of doing part of this in the cath lab as a catheter intervention, such as placing a stent, and part of it surgically. So for a baby with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the hybrid surgery generally means that you're putting a stent in the ductus as a way of making sure that blood flow proceeds to the body unobstructed, and then you're restricting the blood flow to the lungs by placing some bands or ligatures, if you will, around the two arteries into the lungs, the right and left pulmonary arteries. Hybrids 
are used as the primary mode of therapy in some centers. I think, candidly, they were often used in centers where traditional Norwood surgery had poor results, and therefore hybrid surgeries turned out to be a safer way and uh, led to better survival. But I don't think that for the standard risk um, baby with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, there's really an improvement or better outcome for hybrid surgery. It does, however, play an important role, we think, for the very high-risk babies. So, for example, babies that are born with extremely low birth weight, where doing the traditional surgery is fraught with increased difficulties, or babies that are significantly premature. And so your concerns about placing them on the heart-lung machine, giving them heparin, which prevents blood from clotting during that time, are riskier, if you will, because you could start to see other complications. So that a hybrid operation, which allows you to avoid some of that, may well allow these babies to survive and then to grow and develop to a point where they then become better risk candidates for the standard Norwood. So at least in our own center, what we are doing is we are utilizing hybrid surgeries for the very high risk babies, and then when they outgrow that risk, so when their prematurity gets them out to say full gestational age or their birth weight, their very low birth weight gets them up to what we would consider a safer size, we then convert them to the Norwood operation then. So it's in essence, an extra operation, but one that we hope will improve survival for that very high-risk group. Okay. Well, it seems like the newest trend that I'm reading about is stem cell therapy. Do you feel that this is the up-and-coming treatment for HLHS babies and possibly even for older HLHS heart warriors? Absolutely. We've made a big investment here at the University of Michigan into stem cell research and have a very active laboratory with a number of MD, PhDs, and PhDs doing research in various parts of stem cells, from growing heart muscle to growing blood vessels to growing valves to growing conduction tissue. And as I often joke with them, I keep saying, why don't we just grow a heart because we got all the parts. Right. (laughs) That sounds good to me. (laughs) I'm all for it because I don't know of any car company that just makes transmissions and brakes without the idea of saying, let's make it into a car. Right. Right. I think we're going to get there someday. I really do. One of my colleagues in congenital heart surgery, Dr. Ming Si, is actively looking at ways to see if he can not just take stem cells, convert them into cardiomyocytes or heart cells, but then actually provide a blood supply to them. So, so far, stem cell therapy has shown some promise, but by and large, to be frank, it's been disappointing in the heart for a number of reasons. Getting these cells to actually convert into heart cells and beat as heart cells, we've been able to do. No problem. Well, that's putting it maybe mildly, but it's certainly able to do. But getting them to beat congruously with the rest of the heart without rhythm problems, getting them to maintain health and survival so that therefore they need nourishment. This is what your blood supply does to provide oxygen and nourishment. That's been the issue. But I think the research is progressing really well. I'm extremely proud of the fact that we have a group of basically four or five researchers, some of whom also do surgery, really actively engaged in looking at this. And I think it's going to be very useful in the future. I'm excited about the prospect of us possibly being able to grow a heart, but since my own son was born and diagnosed with HLHS, I'm curious if there's some way we could use the stem cells to kind of beef up his own heart so he wouldn't need a transplant. Do you think that something like that is possible in the future? Yeah, I do, and that's a very good question, and it's exactly what we're trying to look at. So, for example, older people who have a heart attack and lose part of the muscle of their left ventricles, can we in some way inject or implant stem cells to rebuild that weakened wall so that indeed their heart muscle overall will improve? Hopefully, this is the same sort of thing we might be able to do with patients who have single ventricle hearts, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and other conditions. Can we, in fact, grow heart cells to implant into the patient's own heart cells to strengthen it, for example? That's certainly one area of research and one area that I hope we'll be able to do. We aren't there yet, and it's obviously hard to predict when we will be there, but I think the advances that have been made in the last few years are really phenomenal, and certainly I'm hopeful and optimistic that we will get there in the not terribly distant future. 
That is so exciting to hear. I just am thrilled with what I am reading about the stem cell research. And of course, when you go out on the internet, now on YouTube, you can even see some of the researchers and what they're doing. It's just phenomenal. Exactly. Well, we need to take another quick break, but don't leave yet, listeners, because coming up next, we're going to talk to Dr. Vove about what the advancements that have occurred for HLHS babies means for HLHS adult heart warriors. We'll be back after this quick commercial break. When I saw so many of these CHG groups growing, I found family just ready to join me. Anyone who is a member of the adult congenital heart defect community can be a guest on our show. We have a great year planned and we look forward to sharing other interesting topics. Heart to Heart with Nicole and David, serving the ACHD community, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Did you know that most men suffer from beard itch, ingrown hairs, and a dry face all because they're not using the right shaving tools? At woodraiser.com, we sell handmade heirloom quality badger hair brushes that exfoliate the skin, open the pores, and stimulate hair follicles, which gives a gentleman a closer, more comfortable shave and a clean face. Visit our website, woodraiser.com, where you can learn more about men's skin care and check out our professional shaving tools. A perfect gift for your man, built to last for generations. That's W O O D R A Z O R.com. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Advancements and Treatments for HLHS Heart Warriors, and our guest is Dr. Edward Beauvais. We just finished talking with Dr. Beauvais about the current trends for babies being born with HLHS, but now in our last segment, I'd like to focus on adults with HLHS. So now more HLHS adults are surviving than ever before. Can you tell us about trends you see for adult HLHS survivors? Specifically, is transplant necessarily stage four for HLHS adults? Well, once again, we are learning as as time goes by, and and, um, certainly our group here has an enormous number now of patients who are into their teens and 20s as we follow them and learn from them what issues will develop. I think we know, of course, that the surgery that we now do fairly routinely is excellent surgery and it provides the best palliation we can, but we also realize that we are not creating normal hearts. And that will likely be a limitation in the type of heart that we can surgically reconstruct as these patients grow into adulthood. I don't think we know yet when that's going to be. I don't think we really even know if it's going to be for all patients, but I think we do know problems will occur. You're right in saying that at least today, transplantation is the mode of choice, if I can put it that way, for patients who have a failing Fontan. The Fontan may fail for a different reason, sometimes because the heart muscle weakens, sometimes because the lungs are perhaps not as healthy as we'd like. And so the replacement of the heart with a donor four-chamber heart currently is what we really have to offer. Transplantation remains limited because the donor hearts are limited, and of course, we are seeing a large pool of these patients now getting older, and so it's going to put a strain on the availability of donor hearts. So what a lot of research is now going into, and I am also proud to say here in Ann Arbor, we are developing a very vigorous research plan in looking at assist devices. I'm sure everybody knows that there are these various kinds of assist devices for patients who have serious heart problems or have cardiomyopathies and that we can even replace the heart with a total artificial heart. But we're looking at ways that we may now be able to design some of these assist devices, some of which are not a lot bigger than your index finger, to support the single ventricle. Can we recreate potentially a configuration of the heart that would allow a totally implantable assist device to be placed that can essentially provide a pump and provide a blood flow source into the lungs and or to the body depending on what's necessary. So I see that these are the two biggest areas basically so far transplantation and the development of really patient-friendly assist devices that we will begin to learn more and more about and probably use more and more as these patients reach adulthood. So are you saying that there's a possibility that some of these assist devices could actually help the surgeons to create a four-chamber heart for children born with HLHS? 
Well, it's not really creating a four-chambered heart, but it's mimicking the physiology of having four chambers. We already know we can put a totally implantable heart in a patient take their heart out so you can place that in. But the goal would be to utilize the patient's own heart, but perhaps add an assist. In other words, perhaps add a right ventricle. By that, I mean the assist device, which could help propel blood through the lungs. So when that becomes necessary at an older age, there may be a way to do this with an assist device that provides what's lacking in an adult with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, namely the right ventricle. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I should say their pulmonary ventricle as their anatomic right ventricle is now their systemic ventricle. Right, right. Wow, that's amazing. And then they wouldn't have to worry about immunosuppressant drugs or rejection of the heart because it would be their own heart. Do you have to worry about rejection of the device? No, you really don't. And, you know, our our belief has always been so long as your heart is working, you're better off with your own heart than you are with a donor heart. So, yes, we can provide many more years of really useful and good quality of life with these kinds of assist devices, which I think, again, will be reality. Then we can avoid the issues of insufficient donor hearts, immunosuppression, et cetera. Wow, that's amazing. Well, now that we have more HLHS adults living longer with their Fontan hearts than probably anyone thought they would, what are some of the things that you foresee affecting the HLHS population? Earlier this season, I had a wonderful doctor, Dr. Fred Wu, came on and talked to us about liver complications. My son had an aortic aneurysm that developed, and he ended up having to have a Fontan revision. Can you talk to us about some of those kinds of things that you see happening to an aging HLHS population? Well, you've already touched on one, and that's the liver issues. And more studies are coming out looking at patients, at, certainly in their adult years, trying to discover or at least examine liver function. And we are finding out that liver issues are probably going to be more common than we thought, likely due to the venous hypertension, if you will, that affects the liver so that there's some stasis in the liver as blood doesn't progress through the liver as efficiently as it would with a normal heart. We also know that patients are going to develop rhythm problems, heart rhythm problems, and likely need pacemakers. Already well-known is this condition, so-called protein-losing enteropathy, or PLE, which was still very poorly understood as to why some patients seem to lose a lot of protein in their stool. Surprisingly to me, we have rarely seen late complications of the surgery itself, such as obstruction to blood flow into the lungs, and the aneurysm, which you alluded to, or other problems, which we sort of expected since we're doing all this reconstructive surgery in a tiny heart, that when they grow to be a adult, well, isn't there going to be some issue? The way we've done it here in Ann Arbor, and I think a lot of other centers do it the same way, We're not seeing that. I don't mean to say it never occurs, but it's been strikingly uncommon to see that even in a large number of now fully grown patients in their teens, 20s, and beyond. So that's been rewarding to see that we haven't needed to go back and deal with valve problems very often, aneurysms, obstruction in the lungs, or obstruction in the aorta. Occasionally it happens. Occasionally we can deal with it. Often if we need to, we can deal with it in the cath lab. But so far anyway, that's been very uncommon to see. Wow. Well, that's good to hear. I'm wondering if there's a connection between the PLE and the problems with the liver. Well, yes, it likely has something to do with all of that. Again, if you think about the whole physiology of the Fontan, you have higher venous pressures than you should have. You have lower pressures in your lungs than you should have. So it's really, as has been coined, the so-called Fontan paradox. This, over the course of time, is going to cause some difficulties with the intestines, with the liver, and hopefully not, but perhaps with other organ systems that we honestly don't even know yet. Right, because we haven't had people surviving to their 50s or 60s with this kind of heart per se. We have seen other heart defects that were treated with the Fontan. Have any of those studies that have been done on other patients who were treated with the Fontan helpful to what you can predict might happen with these long-term HLHS survivors? I'm not sure that there's been any single group that's been studied better than the HLHS patients. 
If you think about it, one of the most remarkable things about the development of treatments, and I don't mean just the surgery, but the medical treatment for HLH babies has been the spinoff to all patients with forms of single ventricle. So the things we have learned, we have now been able to apply to patients who have other types of single ventricle and learning how to avoid mistakes with palliative therapy, how to optimize their lung and heart function for the future. I think well, for one, I would say that we and others have published some late studies looking at HLHS compared to other single ventricles to, to try to find out are there differences. By and large, there haven't been a single right ventricle, if it's healthy, seems to hold up just as well as a single left ventricle, so long as it's healthy. But I don't know that we have enough data to really substantiate that, particularly into 40s and 50s. We do have patients with single ventricles who are in their 50s, but if you think back 50 years ago, the treatment for any form of single ventricle was so primitive that really it was rare for any of these patients to survive, and survive avoiding the risks that we now know we need to avoid. Right, right. Well, given your history with HLHS over the last several decades, what do you think the next big advancement will be for the HLHS community? Well, I think, you know, as new problems are diagnosed, innovations and ingenuity will undoubtedly need, lead to new solutions, just as happened 25 years ago when we began this journey with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. I'm always amazed at how when things happen, we're able as a specialty, as a team, to be able to look and figure out a way to go back and solve it. I think right now, as we already talked about, I, I certainly think that the major advances are going to be in stem cell therapy and in assist devices that are, if I can put it mildly, patient-friendly so that they are things that will allow these adults now to still go on and lead active, healthy lives. That's where really much of the focus is, but I think that there will continue to be small advancements, things that may seemingly not seem all that important that we'll be able to go back and say, oh, we can avoid this problem when they're 30 if we do something like this when they're one. So these kinds of advancements will just continue to occur because that's been the history of this condition for decades. What about gene therapy? Do you think that that is something that you'll live to see happen that might even prevent a baby from being born with HLHS? Yeah, I don't know if I'll live to see that. I think we're getting into such issues that to go beyond just the medical use of it and into, of course, what is the right thing to do ethically and morally. But I certainly see that field developing as well, that we will be able to perhaps modify a gene, discover the gene that may lead to these types of heart conditions and be able to modify that even before conception or soon thereafter to be able to avoid these conditions. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? It would. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program today, Dr. Beauvais. Well, it's my pleasure. It's really great to talk to you and to talk to your audience. Well, that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern time for the final episode of the ninth season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Until then, please find and follow our radio show on Spreaker. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more.